Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Muriel Borst Parent, and I'm with very three artistic directors here who are female women, and they're women of color. And I thought I would just like to get these wonderful women together who I have spent, a, have a long history with, who I admire, and who I've collaborated with, and see if I can say this without crying, and three women who have been here uh, for me, and we all have been here for each other through dark times and good times, and we really were figuring out how to support each other in this world that we navigate as artistic directors. And I really felt it was important to do this during um, Women's History Month, because sometimes we tend to forget the women of color, and we tend to forget what we had to go through and a generate what we have to go through now and what a generation before us had to go through right and how they open door for us sometimes we're standing in the door and there are ones after us that we're opening the door for i would just like to give a shout out um since this is uh women's history month to the women who are watching this and who are friends of mine uh i would like to talk about uh just Give a shout out to my ancestors, my grandmother, um, Lisa Mayo, and um, Tanya Ganella Frischner, who were my mentors, who were the women who raised me and give, gave me strength, and why I'm sitting in these positions. I would like to give a shout out to my mother, to my mama Rose, Muriel Miguel of Spider Woman Theater, Gloria Miguel. I'd like to give a shout out to my cousin Monique Mujica. I would like to give a big shout out to women who I now just got off the phone with who are working on the front lines at the UN right now. Betty Lyons, Evie Lug Ogura, and um, I would also like to acknowledge uh, another friend of mine who is also on the front lines, and uh, uh, Faith Merrick. And um, I would like to give a shout out to my daughter, who's the future generation, and she's a mother, and she's a performer, and my granddaughter, who is also a female, Ellen Nisqua. And that is our future generations of my family line. Uh, my name is Muriel Borst Tarrant. I'm Kunan Rappahannock. And I would like these wonderful women to introduce themselves. I always like to say I'm the artistic director of Safe Harbors New York City. Introduce themselves, talk, uh, and who were your inspirations and those women before you? Thank you, Muriel. Hello, hello. It's so good to see you. This is really such a treat. And thank you for gathering us and so that we could share space together today. So thank you. Uh, so I'm Avery Willis Hoffman, and I am the um, currently the artistic director of the Brown Arts Institute, uh, which is at Brown University. Uh, it's a new institute. We're um, swiftly forming all of our mission and goals, um, and we've just opened a new performing arts center on Brown's campus. So it's a, a grand adventure that's happening up there in Providence. Um, but I would love to, to shout out um, a number of women who have really been critical, I think, in my up upbringing, and we'll also try not to get too emotional. Um, and I, I think it's almost important to be emotional, right? Yeah. Because I think that um, emotional line is sort of what keeps keeps us strong sometimes. Um, and I've noticed recently that um, in thinking about some of my ancestors, that emotion has gotten the better of me, and I've actually been really glad to be open to it. I think often we feel like we have to shut that down. We have to present a certain way, right? We have to be tearless and strong. Um, but I, I want to shout out to um, Toni Morrison, who um, was really one of the, the biggest inspirations for me growing up. Um, she, a uh, professor at Princeton, uh, was my dad's first cousin, and my dad was an only child. So Toni was really, and all of his cousins of that generation, were really his sisters and brothers. Um, and so I called her aunt or auntie. Um, and, you know, uh, I've often told this story of she used to, I used to write these stories as a kid, and I was so excited about my stories. And then I would give them to her, and she would redline them. And the only thing left was like the and and and. You know, <laughs> just I'm like, what happened to all those and everything? Um, but I'm so grateful to her, her attention, even as a child, you know, her attention to me, knowing that I was the next generation, knowing that, um, you know, I had, she saw promise in me and, and when others did not. 
and she was really an attentive um, family member and a mentor. So my writing skills improved dramatically, my ways of communication, my empathy, my powers of observation, all the things that I feel really strong in now. I feel like she was a, a shepherdess. Um, and also would love to shout out to my mother who uh, is an artist and um, is just one of these gentle, angelic souls, um, really taught me to care and to um, uh, love everyone in whatever way is possible, and sometimes it's hard, right? Um, and she is one of those um, amazing artists who has an incredible attention to detail and loves colors, different colors, and different kinds of ways of expressing um, family expressing um, the things that tie us together. So definitely want to shout out to her. And in the spirit of what you said as well, Muriel, uh, shout out to my daughter, Georgia Ann, who is seven, who is really precocious and you know ready to take over the world. Um, and I see so much uh, in her that really gives me hope for the future. Um, she's feisty and fierce and will not let anyone, including older brother, boss her around, which I <laughs> absolutely love. Um, and, you know, I think that's kind of generational, the passing down of, um, you know, these, um, this knowledge, and even though it may traverse lots of different ways, um, I kind of hold that with me each day, and especially during times of challenge. So lots of other folks to shout out as well, but I think I'll stop here and I'll, I'll pass the mic. Thank you, and thank you for welcoming us to this conversation. Um, I bring into this conversation, I'm a namesake child. Um, I think my mom knew I was the last one she was going to have out of her body, so um, she brought some of the names in there. So I will start with, I was born in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands, and my maternal grandmother, Elise Gibbs, um, who was a great lover of stories, and so I think I sometimes take my storytelling from her. Um, on the other side, Patricia Panazzini. I was named after her. She had passed by the time I came in, um, but she was a deep lover of fashion. And uh, so I, I think of her sometimes when I dress. I see pictures of her when she was young and she always dressed. Um, my mother, Angela McGregor, who was a painter, a storyteller, and in the Caribbean, she was an art teacher. And so we grew up with carnival and she would, so uh, people say, what was your childhood like? And I said, it smelled like paste <laughs> and, it, and it was full of sequins. Mm -hmm. And so we just, uh, she was always sewing um, costumes for us for carnival and Caribbean dance company. Speaking of Caribbean dance company, Curlis, who was just, I, I saw her recently back in St. Croix and she's actually a very slight woman, but to me, she was like an icon. She was like s kind of etched in stone. And she was both so powerful and so fun and so playful and lived in her body in such an amazing way. And so I bring Curlis in with me when I, th and, and my sister, the reason I was at, Cur I was always the clown who couldn't really do the dances, <laughs> but my sister was a very serious ballerina, Paloma McGregor. She's an amazing choreographer and dancer. She works in Urban Bush Women and Liz Lerman and a lot of amazing um, uh, women-led dance choreographer, think tanks and, um, and, so she was the reason why I was there. In terms of some of my theatrical journey, um, I'll name Anna Devere Smith, who I, I saw, I will see at a reading next week. And she was, I remember feeling so inspired and so seen by seeing her work. Um, she worked with Liz Diamond, who ended up, uh, we worked together, she ended up being the head of a program at Yale. Um, and I will just say, there, there are actually so many women I could name. I could name Entezake. I could name, you know, and I realized it took me a long time. It took me until getting to New York to have men at the heads of the table. My, my high school head of my program, my college head of my program, so there were always so many women who were the heads of the table that it made it feel automatic to me in a certain kind of way. And it was so, sh and I'm so grateful for every single one of those women who paved the way, who made me think, oh, well, that's just the way it goes. And so I'm often so surprised by the model that is not what they showed me. And then the wisdom of some people around who go, no, 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 strategize, you've got to step back a bit. 
because I'm used to so many of those women who taught me to s boldly step forward and they didn't teach it by telling me, they taught it by doing. And so, and I'll just last, I'll name, um, I just left my daughter Jupiter who is always tells everyone I'm the biggest planet and may she, <laughs> may she always feel that. Um, and her niece, my niece Olamina, um, I think so much what has been passed to me, through me and what I wanna pass to them. And I feel grateful that every sister circle that I've been in my whole life and predating and hopefully I will help shepherd um, moving forward is really the, the fuel and the inspiration of my life. So grateful to be here with these people, honored. Um, I think I cannot, um, I must mention Ellen Stewart. Um, we're in one of her buildings. Um, I still think of this as being her house, her home. Um, the founder of Ellen, uh, La Mama. I didn't say who I was, I'm Nia. Did you say who you were? Oh, no, maybe you not. Didn't. <laughs> it's so funny, it's like in naming everyone else. I, I'm Patricia McGregor and I'm the artistic director of New York Theatre Workshop in this current incarnation. Thank you for the reminder. See, sisters always got your back, always got your back. Wait a minute. Um, I'm Mia. Um, artistic Director of La Mama. Um, I'm so, um, I feel so blessed to be able to be uh, here in this community that is La Mama, and, and La Mama then is a much bigger, wider mesh of communities and partners and um, colleagues and family, and this table to me embodies a lot of that. Um, cultural mesh, but it goes beyond just sort of the work that we do, I believe. Um, so Ellen Stewart, who basically, um, for me, I mean, she taught me so many things, but I guess the thing that I will mention today is just that we can create our own model, because that's what she did, right? And that um, we don't have to sort of follow what has happened before, not that we shouldn't, um, learn about our history or understand why these specific structures have uh, developed and are the way they are, but that we can also pave new ground, which is what she did. And um, recently, um, my mother passed, um, so I feel I must mention her name, Janice Yu, um, who, Peggy Shaw, because um, it's still raw, I have to admit, um, Sh Peggy Shaw of Split Bridges sent me um, a note, um, probably like maybe it was a week and a half or two weeks after she passed, and it was beautiful because it kind of g went through what a parent um, would want to say to their child. And the last thing that was written on this note was, if all I have when I die is my love, then give me away. And I just thought, wow, isn't that so empowering to think that that's my responsibility now is somehow, in, in I mean, yes, you still grieve and you still go through that process of, of mourning, but that this is, can be life affirming <laughs> too in a way. And maybe that's what I must sort of now do is to take what she's given me and put it back out into the world. And somebody else, because we've all mentioned our daughters, I have to mention my daughter, Una Clark, who hopefully she feels that love. And um, I, I um, it's such a, she's 15 now, and I was just telling Avery, sometimes she walks into the room and I'm like, oh my God, who is this person? I'm, I'm imagining you felt that way as she was, as, as Josie was getting older, right? It's like, wow, this is a, actually a, starting, you're starting to feel like they're becoming women. And um, and I, I'm just so, um, that she's this empathetic, sensitive, aware, self-aware, but also really aware of the room. I mean, I'm, I, um, I'm very proud of her. That's wonderful. And I love that, that we talked about women and those women. And I forgot to mention, you know, Lois Weaver and Peggy Shaw. Those were huge influences in my life because they were a part of Spider-Woman theater, right? 
And you know, and Lois Weaver, it's very funny when you grow up in the business, you know, trying to get a drink of wine when you're 10 years, 11 years old. And she used to be like, okay. And she was like, yeah, she, like, I bet you, and then she would just be like, okay. <laughs> It's very hard to be bad when you have a, you come from this family who are all performers and everyone's avant-garde and everyone, you know, it's like, outrageous. it's outrageous. And then you try to be outrageous and they're like, no, that's good. Okay. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you know, can I have a cigarette? No, I don't think so. <laughs> There's a famous story. I was on the corner of La Mama. This is my icebreaker. I was in the corner of La Mama and I was smoking a cigarette. Oh I was God. nine, and someone came over. Yeah. And, so, and, and someone came over and said to me, "I'm telling your mother." And I said, "I don't care. I don't care." And here came my mother, <laughs> and, she and she cared as I was dragged into the theater. <laughs> my neck. So it's very hard. Um, so you know, all of you know, I grew up in theater, and I just was like, oh, and I have one more shout out. Christina Tarrant is my niece, and she is the ED of Safe Harbors, and she was mentored by my husband. It's very interesting. She was mentored, but and so like I just I forgot about her, and I just want her to know I if she's listening to this. But the one thing I wanted to say, and this is, how's it going? <laughs> You know, how's it going? You know, like, you know, I, I don't want it to be formal. Like, this is the moderator. I just think we just need to, you know, talk. And what do women, you know, talk about like us who are constantly on the move, who are constantly working, who are constantly thinking outside of the box, thinking about community. Where is community going? What is the future of theater? You know, we're always in these rooms. So let's just kind of like, so how's it going? How's it going? You know, let's start with you, Patricia. How's it going? I would say um, the big it lives in extremes. And the extreme goods are really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, <coughs> we have right now, um, our newest company in residence is Jupiter's Performance Project, Ebony Noel Golden, mm -hmm. incredible artist, organizer, dancer, um, and the fact that we have been able to open up our space. And she said, we say, what do you need? And she said, space. And so like right now to know that I'm not there, but we are able to open our doors and give space. Um, <coughs> knowing when there's visionary artists at all entry points, when we can be of service, um, when there are productions or convenings or readings or a pot, we have a potluck coming up where people can gather and build community and be inspired. We had a gala with Liesl Tommy that you were at that was like amazing. It was really, um, it was an inspiring. So there's great, great joy and there's great, great challenge as well. I think one of the things we bring to the table is, is our superpower of empathy. And it means that we feel all of the things and we f when the challenges are there, we, we absorb them. And I think that we have probably, we are multi-hyphenates <laughs> from the day we kick out of the womb. And um, so I would say for me, it's, it's in those extremes. Um, but I think life is always in those extremes. And I think this moment gives us an opportunity to be really clear about why we are building structures and resources to be able to um, help continue the support of artists and communities and conversations that that illuminate and and enliven and challenge us, and that we also are. Um, a I feel right now my feet firmly on the ground, and that we are also able to ground in a way that I I think of it as whether you this is right or wrong or however it's a it feels like a very maternal grounding when something is really shaking in a in a very challenging way it reminds me of when something is happening with one of my children or or what was happening in childbirth where you're literally like let me put my feet into the ground connect with the earth my ancestors purpose and um I think often people think of love as a lightweight thing, but love is a heavyweight boxer. And I feel like um, women really know what it is to lead with love. And so I would say that really helps in, in the joyful things, because it means like sometimes those boxing gloves are full of confetti and it's so joyful. And sometimes it means that you can really like 
squat down to your center and and bear a thing, a moment um, with both empathy and strength. And so that's what I'd say. I'd say it's living in the extremes and, and thus is the world. And so we try to be very centered while we hold the extreme. For me, I'm I'm questioning a lot. You know, I question maybe not every single day when I go to work, but I, I feel like um, I've been talking a lot about these um, breakfast coffees that I have with my husband in the morning after Yuna has gone to, to school because I, I, I need that. I need that moment of with somebody who I care deeply about, who, who um, somebody who I trust, you know, how can I sort of process all these questions that I have and, and um, what does it mean to be doing the work that we're doing and and I still love going to work every single day, but I have a lot of questions of what we're doing. What what does it mean to be doing what we're doing, and how should we be doing what we're doing, and how do we expand upon what we're doing? Because sometimes you just don't feel like you're really having enough impact. I don't know if you guys feel that way, but that's um, like um, part of that. The those challenging moments are feeling like I'm not doing enough, you know? Um, so I would say, yeah, a lot of questioning for me. Thank you. I, I can totally agree with all of that. Um, I think what's been really interesting for me is to be at the beginning of something. Um, and I know, you know, you, you have started something, each of you are kind of inheriting, but also reinventing. Um, in my particular space, we are in inventing something new within a really storied institution um, and very conscious of the moment, you know, coming out of the pandemic, everything that we've all been through as artists, as leaders, um, as being in this cultural space, this communal space. Um, and so I've been thinking about what does it mean to be essentially a startup within an Ivy League institution, <laughs> for example. Um, and uh, so we uh, have opened a new building. So we have a new structure that needs to be um, enlivened and peopled, and, but with a certain spirit that maybe isn't the spirit that wasn't in that particular location before, shall we say. Um, and starting a new institute for the arts in this moment on a college campus where our, our main audience are hundreds and hundreds of young people who are worried about the future, excited about the future, worried about what they might do in the world, excited about what they might do in the world, like this roller coaster, you know, talk about the extremes, right? Um, and thinking a lot, and, and we've had some of these conversations about how do you bring artists into that mix? Right, what are the needs that artists have coming out of the pandemic? Um, and you mentioned that too, like how do we meet those needs? How do we meet them in a way, um, as you were saying, Mia, with a new model? Like what is, what is that new model? Um, and one of the metaphors that I've been using is you know, literally building the plane while flying it. And that is so chaotic and scary. And so to, to what you were saying, particularly, how do you ground while you're literally in the air and you've got like one wing maybe is working. <laughs> There's kind of an engine, you know, like are no you the, the no wave. food, <laughs> you know, exactly. Like am I the pilot? Um, am I the passenger? Are there, is there anyone on this plane with me? <laughs> you know? And like that chaos um, and how do we, how do you bring calm, sane leadership to that kind of environment within an institution that has been a certain way for hundred like pre the founding of the United States of America. So um, it's been it's been challenging to figure out what where is where is the calm pilot with the hat on, like I know where we're going, this is what we're doing, and embracing the immense creativity that's possible when you're starting something. Like we don't have to do the old model. Um, and we were joking about this a little bit. Like I, I, I said to Muriel, I'm like, I'm allergic to seasons. Can we just not do seasons? <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> um, I said, I'm allergic to subscriptions. Can we not do subscriptions? <laughs> what? <laughs> She's like, are you okay? Like, should we take your temperature? You know, so, like, so what does it mean to throw out those models and start with something else? Um, 
So that's kind of, yeah, for me, what does it mean to be at the beginning in this moment, not just be at the beginning, but in this moment? I love to name, it's really, I have a photo of it, and it's one of my favorite moments, because as you name where are we going, I also think who are we going with is as important as where where are we going, because that's going to help us know where we're going. And so one of my, when we speak about new models, one of my favorite moments of this whole, I've been here about a year and a half, and um, in my first season, Little Amal, there was, you know, Mia was a huge part of, of organizing Little Amal, the whole, the whole, you know, everything about it when it came to New York. Muriel helped with it as well. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, that, that incredible. And I love that, you know, of course, this young woman, you know, Little Amal being this young woman. And, and there was a new model, you know, there was a, there was this moment where we had a curtain time. It was this time, and that's the way the curtain time was. And we found out it was right. the day that the, and I said, well, we have to change the curtain yeah, time, you know, like, I, and that and took some doing, and, and the audience yeah. will go with us. And there was this whole, there was this whole kind of like plan, but wish in a prayer a little bit. And the idea was that the, that an actor, because there was a similarity between the play and the, and the little Amal's journey. So we said, well, in a dream world, the actor will come and then maybe there'll be a moment that the little Amal meets and, but it's all a little tentative. There are variables that you don't know. So the street, we never rehearsed <laughs> it. And, but I looked across the street that night, the street was filled. And as a person who loves carnival and outside and parade, it was my dream. The street is filled. Pe some people came, some people happened upon it. It's totally accessible to everyone. It's virtuosi virtuosic and accessible and wonderful. And so it was gonna be fabulous no matter what. And then me and I are running down the street. <laughs> you know, I, I'm with the actor. She's with Amal, and, and we know there's this one, there's just one little moment mm -hmm. where it could happen or not, and it'll be okay no matter what. And there's this photo of we both kind of ushered our mm -hmm. people together, and there's a photo of the two of us mm -hmm. on the sides mm -hmm. watching the moment of little Amal mm -hmm. and this actor, like two proud moms. <laughs> like we, and I thought to myself, it's not just the theory, but the partnership, the people, and the people who believe and will put in not just the like time, but the mm -hmm. kind of sweat equity and the hope yeah. and all of that. So I just, and the heart, I mean, really the heart into it. Um, and so I think it's so important to think where are we going, but I also think who are we going with because that's going to help define where we can go in a really amazing way. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that's important too. I, I, I think, you know, we talk about changing the paradigm and all of that. But if we use the, or I hate the word organic, but I can't think of another one right now. But if we think about that, what is our indigenous teaching, no matter where we're at? And like, that's how I, I try to see things. You know, it's like what, you know, I can only, I, I can only uh, direct and organize the way I was taught. Right, and, and and I think my mother said that to me one time because I someone was correcting, and she said you can only do what you're taught, mm -hmm. spiritually, you know, physically, you know, you can only do what you're taught, and and so sometimes like you want to have those teachings and put that in theater and put that on the outside, and how does that work? You know, how does that work, and especially feminine, you know. Feminism is, I don't know, maybe this is our next question I'll put out there, is, you know, I know what feminism is to me, because I come from matriarchal society, right? The women, with the Kuna women, we take, you know, you're considered extremely rich if you have daughters, right? Because the, the husbands come and they, they live, you know, they help the mother and whatever. And so, but I come from a very matriarchal society on the Rappahannock side too. So a lot of times, you know, I, I talked to my mother because there was a lot of pushback about feminism at one point. And I said, and, and I had friends who said, you know, I refuse to wear that label because it's not for me. And, you know, when I talked to my mother, and I think I talked to Lois Weaver about this, she's like, well, we work so hard. I'm not giving up that type. I'm not giving it up because I work too hard for it. And even though if we're going to change feminism, let's, you know, change the language to it. And that's a question I like to, like, popcorn out there a little bit, is, like, going into these rooms, right, all of our jobs have most likely have been male, right, very male-dominated in Western, in the Western theater field. Um, what I see is women are now dominating, you know. Oh, but 
to me, I was brought up, women always dominate. I'm like, you can't, like, I'm very, sh I was shocked. I mean, utterly shocked when I went to the UN. And, you know, and it was this disrespectful and, and all of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I remember coming back and saying, I'm so shocked, you know, because w the way I was brought up and the way, because I'm a big part of um, La Mama too, is that women had a voice, right? And women have a big voice, you know? And if you know my mother, she has a huge voice, right? And my family has a bigger voice as women. So do you see that pushback when you come into these rooms that are dominated? How do you navigate that? How, how do you navigate that as a woman of color? Do you see it? Does it affect you? You know, it's just, you know, what do you think, Avery? No? <laughs> yes, maybe. <laughs> Do I have to go first? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I, I have to say I, I didn't know Ellen, but Ellen was still very much an incredible like men like mentor from at large, a mentor at large for me. Because what I so admired about Ellen was she was true to herself. And she had a the personality that she had, she was just true to that. And I think for me in these spaces. I have to be true to myself. I have to be true to who I am, how I navigate um, certain situations, certain environments. And I, you know, I grew up in essentially an all-white um, environment. My mother is white. Um, you know, I grew up uh, very close to Princeton University. My father was a professor at Princeton. Everyone there was essentially white, except for you know a few of the African American professors. Um, and so for me growing up, it's like what you're saying about <laughs> growing up in a matriarch. I just, I grew up in a white, uh, there wasn't anything abnormal about that to me. I think as I grew older and I, other people started telling me, oh, you are not like everyone else in this room. And other people started shining that red hot light on me like, oh, you don't have straight hair or being the tan factor at school, like, oh, I'm gonna, oh, look, I'm uh, almost as tan as Avery, and I'd be like, wait, what, it, wait, what does that all actually mean? Um, or being out in public with my mother and people making comments about, the, of course I wasn't her daughter, how was that even possible, even though we look exactly alike except for our skin color. Um, so for me, I just, like, it doesn't occur to me in a way that anything's strange to be in a room full of men or a room full of women. Yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I what I want to be true to is myself and how I behave and how I um, uh, hold space. Um, and I've noticed through my time and even as a, as a an adult now, it's it's those moments of um, yeah, it's other people calling something out. Those microaggressions, those moments where you're like, oh, I. You're not treating me as a full human. You're not actually acknowledging who I am in this space and what I have been through and who I am. And it's those moments that are jolting to me. And I often, even to this day, still I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, like, wait a minute. Did you just actually say that to me? Um, hmm, okay, how, how am I going to negotiate that? So um, I, I think we each carry with us, you know, our histories and, and our experiences and probably each deal with things in different ways, um, but for me, I'm I tend to be a listener first, and I try to kind of assess the room and listen to how folks are talking to each other and treating each other, and um, and adapt uh, accordingly. Like I had a conversation recently with someone who was really condescending, um, in a way of like assuming that I didn't know what I was doing, that I had you know. It was really chilling, um, and then my decision making was about how to sh how to hold my hold my ground in that space and how to um, bring in without behaving like that person, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Which is also I feel like a very female way, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the we kind of observe, uh, articulate, and then kind of reimagine, but we we try not to, or I'll speak for myself, I try not to behave in the way that I'm, that behavior that I'm receiving. Um, that takes a lot of energy, you know, that takes a lot of um, processing time. And so I think I'm still learning, I'm still learning, but I, that, that grounding, that sort of like, this is who I am, this is what I believe in, um, and I'm not willing to transform myself into the behaviors that I see around me. 
as hard as that may be. Um, and that, that makes for treacherous territory kind of all the time. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a process and I think still learning how to navigate that. Um, and also remembering what my strengths are, you know, and acknowledging my strengths and finding strengths in other people who maybe can um, help resolve a certain kind of situation if it's not going the way. That's not all on me, right? All eyes might be on me, but it's not all on me to resolve or move forward. So I think that's a, it's an ongoing process, at least for me at least. Um, I very proudly call myself a feminist, and I think there's so many ways to define that. Um, I think visually a lot, so sometimes I think um, if masculinity is associated with rugged individualism, which it's not exclusive and that can be problematic, but that's one way I see a certain line. I think of um, feminism, which is in many ways about equal access, breaking down barriers, you know, all of those things. But I also think that there's a way in which we can identify certain differences, not exclusively, but if I were to say there's a kind of linear, rugged individualism um, that could be patriarchy, <laughs> it could be, that there's a, a kind of um, cyclical collective action. There's a cyclical sense that I think of um, a, a, as a, a feminine power that idea that if you want to go fast, go by yourself, but if you want to go far, go with people. And so um, I think it's a, it's a very powerful thing that can be um, mislabeled or, or misunderstood, but I think it's about intentionality, power, collective building. Um, I also think it's very interesting having been from a very young age, you know, again, I had a lot of women leaders in rooms, so I just assumed that's what you did. I like played sports, I was always, you know, I played the trumpet, I always wanted to be loud, I, you know. <laughs> and part of what's interesting, um, I met recently with James Bundy, who was the head of um, the drama program at Yale, and he said, and we used to have, we used to really wrestle about things, I mean, really, really wrestle about things. And we met recently, and he said, from the sheer force of your will, you will get things done. And in this particular position coming in, it is the place where I, um, I'm used to being the underdog in a certain kind of way. And so now, part of, I think, the wrestling with the idea of what this feminine power is or fem you know, feminism is, I've been used to doing something from like the sheer force of my will. And now people go, whoa, 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 you have all this positional power, which is not always structural power, but it is positional power. You have all this positional power, and now we want you to shrink. When you were kind of coming up, it was a good thing that you had all this, and now there's, an, there's much more pushback, um, or maybe my response to the pushback is very different. It was much more overt before, or I would say, okay, this is, this is like, this is the wrestling match, and now it's much more covert, but it's very there that sense of now you're in this place that there are certain ways in which women in this position, in this perceived at the top, at the head of the table, at whatever that place is, um, there I do feel this sense of um, a desire to shrink that into a more manageable place. And so uh, uh, as a listener, I spent some time really thinking and considering, and very recently, I still want to be thoughtful, I still want to be considerate, I still want to be collective, but I've decided it will be too much of a cost if I don't come out as myself as well. Um, and so uh, that's a roundabout way of getting at that, but I do think, and I think about it for my daughter. You know, I think about my ability to sh metabolize, shape shift, figure out what is going to be most useful, but at the end of the day, you have to figure out your most authentic self, even in a position that has a lot of either real or perceived positional power. And that's different for men than women. I will come out in a very firm way, and sometimes that will, you're, like, you're yelling. And it's like, no, I'm not yelling. I'm just clear. Whereas with a male, it will, it, you know, that's, that's, that's clarity. That's power. Mm -hmm. Whereas with a woman, it will often be perceived as being taking up more space. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's an interesting, interesting journey. I guess I'm... I'm pretty lucky. <laughs> the landscape that I came into was 
a woman who was in power and made sure that you knew it, you know, and, and she didn't apologize for it. She didn't, you know, as you were saying, Avery, you know, she was her authentic self. And, and so I feel really like I'm in, uh, not to say that there are not other places like La Mama all over, and, uh, um, but I do feel that I am in a very unique place that is La Mama, where we're mostly women in that office, you know? Um, and uh, so that, th that uplifting of others, you know, or that feeling that, um, you know, how do I make sure that everyone feels invested or, or feels as though they are part of something and that they're, in terms of this idea, you know, I'm always talking about, I don't think of it as somebody in charge or somebody who has the power, but that we all have different res responsibilities, right? And that um, some responsibilities are shared, some responsibilities are a little bit more overarching, some responsibilities are really sort of very specific in certain areas, but that we all have this sort of shared responsibility of making sure that La Mama is okay and that we stay true to our mission of being servi uh, of service to artists and our broader community. So I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of in a really special place in that of, of not always being in rooms with a lot of male, white male dominance, you know? And, um, but one <laughs> instance where um, it kind of hit me in this, um, I, I was caught off guard, to be totally honest, but I tried to stay true and authentic to myself, but it was, um, La Mama had just gotten our Tony Award, which was kind of, um, you know, it was shocking, you know, I, when I got that call, I was, I, I, I was like, thank you, thank you, um, this is so wonderful, and then I got off the phone and talked to our, our, our dear press agent, Sam Rudy, and I said, what award did we just get? <laughs> I had no idea that this award even existed, to be honest, um, uh, which was amazing, and, and how um, fortunate we were, you know, I, I say it was a testament to the artistic community that is La Mama. Um, um, it, it, yeah, uh, it was it was a wonderful moment, but we were in, is it Don't, don't Tell Mamas? Well, the, 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 the yes. yes, is that the, the bar or the, the club? And um, it was all these white male critics in the room because that that's who, you know, that's, that's behind sort of the Tony Awards still probably to a certain extent. And um, w it was a question and answer that I had with Jonathan Mendel, who um, is uh, somebody that I also hold dear and uh, a critic, white male. Um, but um, one of the questions that was asked um, was, oh, as you try to sort of create um, a platform for that multiplicity of voices and, and, and focusing on diversity, um, do you feel like you're compromising quality? And I took that in and I was like, uh, the only thing I could say in that moment was no. Um, and Deep Tron actually, a uh, um, wonderful writer, you know, um, wrote about it in American theater that moment because I think all of us of color, maybe um, of not of, you know, uh, of the male gender, I think we were kind of all in a state of shock. Like, how could this question actually have come up in this person's mind? Um, and I think that's a time when I realized, okay, wait, maybe there is something else that is not, you know, that, that I have to kind of consider beyond this bubble that is La Mama, you know, or this um, world that is La Mama. Sometimes it feels like a bubble, but because, um, yeah, we just, we're constantly, it's fle festival time all the time at La Mama. So it's, it's sometimes hard to kind of come up for air and not to see my neighbor and not <laughs> to see my dear <laughs> colleagues um, and sisters. But um, so, I don't know, I think that idea of, of of really trying to be your authentic self is crucial, right? 
I, I think that's probably the most important thing, and I learned that recently too. It has happened. It's so funny because we're all on the same page. Because I've served on all these boards, and you know, with theater boards and advisory boards, and everything. And you know, sometimes you say to yourself, "Why am I doing this? Like this is I'm getting bashed in the head over here." Or you know, I I don't know what it means with other issues, but with Native issues, you know, you turn around and you say, "Okay, that's great what you just did, but." There's not mention of no. There's no native people on this. You know, I don't understand how that happened. And then they get really quiet. Well, no one applied. I said, did you reach out? You know. So, and I feel that about the authentic self. You know, the same thing with EDI. I find that you know, um, diversity, uh, equal equity, diversity, and inclusion. I was on one of those committees, and the thing was to me, it was like this. We have to start putting into the conversation what Native people are going through, right? And if you ignore that, then what is EDI, right? And I find myself in the same place, like, should I say something? Should I not say something? Do, you know, am I going to hurt people's feelings? And it's actually my daughter who's, you know, another, and we'll go into this question too, is the other generation that's coming up after us. And the gender, I, ha I, I raised a very mouthy daughter. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where she came from. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, it's like, oh my God, can't you just be a little diplomatic? No, they've been taking advantage of this and we're a woman in the room. We're women the color of the room. We're the last person we have to talk about marginalized issues now. And it's like, okay. <laughs> so you say to yourself, okay, I say, but what if you lose funding because of that? It doesn't matter. And so, like, it's that, 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 that fine line because we come from a generation where we have to look at the other side, right? But, you know, the other thing is, you know, you have someone like my mother from um, Spider Woman, and she's fought with everybody and said, if you don't do this, this is just plain and simple racism. And, you know, and Ellen Stewart was her mentor. So, you know, so when, you, you know, and I do agree that, you know, we come from, a, me and Mia come from this certain way of being um, is I don't know if coddled but we this was all very normal to talk about to, to for women to be fierce and everything with the work and to be but when you leave that world you realize oh this is what everyone's talking about right so I would just like to put the question out there and like we have another fit we have 15 minutes but I would just like to, like, how do we, you know, the next generation, what do we see with the next generation? Anybody of, you know, with art, where are we going? How are we going about it? You know, what are we excited about with this next generation of theater makers? I mean, I will in some ways uh, bridge a few things. A, to that comment of the person who asked, you know, is there a, is there a deterioration in, in quality? Um, I often think I love science and I love scientists and I lo I feel like we are all often trying to understand the world or our field and it can feel sometimes academic or and I say what what is the phenomenon in nature right and so in nature I love robust ecosystems we're not trying to have all just pine trees or rivers or you know um, I don't know ladybugs Aphids and ladybugs, they're all, it's all important. It's all interconnected. And so what I keep thinking about is how, and the soil is symbolic because the soil is the thing that has been a certain thing. A tree has grown, grass has grown, and then it has become the soil, and the soil is there to nourish what is next. So when I think of virtuosity or quality, um, or even when I think of Edie and I, to me it's about how do we get the the, the kind of, broad range of virtuosic, fantastic people together so that there's not redundancy, so that we have this robust ecosystem. And then how can I, in my own generational place, somebody has been a pine tree before me, somebody has passed a baton to me, how can I occupy my space in the best kind of way? And then how can I prepare for being that part of the soil to nurture what's coming up next? So I, whenever I have a hit a wall, I just look at nature and say, when, when, how does nature do it? How does nature, uninterrupted by our forces, create the most um, 
robust biodiversity and support things. And there are going to be times, you know, there's seasons and there's cycles. And how, how do you identify with strength and humility where you are in the season and cycle of your ecosystem? And um, I don't have a final point. <laughs> I will just say that when I hit the wall, I go into nature and think to myself, what can I learn from this um, in the environment I'm in right now? I'm really happy you used that because I use that too. I think it's so important. And I uh, I think when you're tr also trying to communicate to, um, as I was mentioning at the beginning of things, when you can lay out an ecosystem and you know what we're doing at Brown is multidisciplinary. So it's theater, it's visual art, it's music, um, it's film, it's you know, it's it's multidisciplinary. Um, and yet many are so siloed within those disciplines. And so trying to kind of create an ecosystem, um, we think a lot about an ecosystem of work as well, right? Like the, the ecosystem includes the stage managers and the directors and the riggers and the, the folks who are preparators, right? Who are putting up those visual art pieces. Um, the, the person who's, who's helping to tune the orchestra, you know, that there's, and that's where I get so much excitement because I think that that ecosystem is so rich and deep. Um, and the more that young people understand and recognize that ecosystem and that it's not one um, like weather uh, moment, right? A weather event. It's not like this crazy storm and we're just in this crazy storm all the time. <laughs> and will we ever get out of this crazy storm? The, the idea that there's an ebb and a flow to that ecosystem, that everyone has their, their part and their participation. Um, that, that sort of metaphor has helped me a lot in talking to young people about their futures. And I think as we all may remember <laughs> applying to college and being in college, it's terrifying. It's such a terrifying time and such an exciting, I said this at the beginning too, such an exciting time at the same time. And the combination of those two things can be really volatile, right? And so I think that's why the arts are such a wonderful place to be when you're young, because that in talking about, you know, the generation of our children, um, the arts open up so many just possibilities. Um, and I mean, I'm a theater kid, too. And I thank God, really, truly, that I learned every possible thing that I could in the theater, because I feel really well equipped now in my current job and the jobs that I've had. Um, and so that ecosystem of work, the ecosystem of making and creating, the ecosystem of um, the health of our society, right? This idea that the arts are essential too, yeah. right? That we need, that we need creativity, we need the arts to just give us these different lenses into our world, different ways of looking at things. So I um, appreciate so much that that's, you know, a, a really strong metaphor for you as well, because it's kind of infinite too, which is lovely, right? Like you can, you can iterate that out in many, many different directions. So thank you. Um, yes, I love this idea of nature. And um, my dad was, um, he's been talking a lot about sort of what are our godlike ingredients and how we look to nature to, to sort of discover those godlike ingredients. And his whole thing these days is that women actually un, um, embody the human godlike ingredient, which is to give life, you know? And um, that has been so much a part of sort of how he's been thinking about what it means to be human as we're, you know, dealing with a lot more of these things yeah. and, you know, uh, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, all of that, and what these things are giving to us in terms of as a society, how do we then really look deeper into what is the essence of what it means to be human, but also what is that the essence of nature too, right? Because um, that's not nature. Um, um, and in terms of like this whole generational conversation that excites me in this moment, um, as I'm thinking about the future of art making or, or uh, the practice of theater, um, is this idea of, um, people wanting to participate in the act of that gathered 
sort of experience, whether we call it ritual, whether we call it performance, you know, or theater. Um, that is something that I feel the uh, younger generations want in, in terms of that artistic experience. You know, I, I use Yuna actually a lot in, in thinking about the future of performance, but also the future of art and, 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 and the making of art. You know, when she saw TV for the first time before the age of two, she was trying to swipe it, right? I mean, I'm sure you guys also, and you're gonna see it in your granddaughter too in terms of these digital natives, right? Is like, how do I not just receive something passively, but how can I be engaged and involved, you know? And maybe that's something that the younger generations, as they're trying to think about transformation and change and the things that aren't working, you know, and wanting to sort of really be engaged in that way and somehow proactive and have agency, that that is also, I think, we, we're seeing it in the making of art and in the making of theater. And um, I was, we, we're working on this um, piece uh, with the Great Jones Repertory Company, La Mama's Repertory Company, Medea, and, um, you know, it's going to be sort of in all of the different floors of the 74 building and, um, there's going to be an online audience that is going to interact with uh, interact with the performance. Um, it's um, looking at Medea through the lens of um, her being a refugee and and sort of that that bigger sort of global refugee moment that crisis moment that we're in. And um, and I was we were trying to figure out what do we call this thing. And I was I went back and I was looking at this idea of happening. And this was this predates La Mama, you know. This was in the '50s, and alternative spaces, and things were changing, and and the act, the event changed because of how the group gathered, and um, and they were talking about the the folks who came as um, not coming with the from the perspective of objective criticism, but of subjective support. And I was like, oh my god, that's what I'm. Seeing and and actually also as a as a artistic director in terms of the the kinds of audiences that I want to bring into our spaces is people who are act who are looking at the work like I'm looking at the work where I'm so heavily invested in this artist in this person in this story in the creative process you know and so how do we start feeling like the gathered group also. Um, is not just sitting back and saying, okay, I gave you money, this transactional thing, so show me what you got, you know? Like, going back to sort of, if we're talking about like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of making, in terms of these structures, I think this, the theater structure that we've now built is because of money getting involved, patriarchy getting involved, whatever, all those things that we've been talking about, um, and that how do we go back to that place where we're all going to be a part of making this thing happen, you know, um, and talking about who are we going on that journey with, you know, and that to me is even happening within the the performances that I'm starting to see being created by by the generations of now, the, you know, the people who are creating now, and of course, you know, I'm I'm imagining yes, the younger generations are going to want to sort of have that kind of artistic experience and engagement. So I know we kind of. We kind of answered this question already, and what, what what so we should end with what's exciting? What are you excited about as an artistic director right right now? We kind of answered that, but you know I'll, I'll, I'll kind of say what I'm excited about. I too feel that the paradigm is shifting, and um, like right now, I again and and working on a play that is outdoors that. All three of you are involved in. <laughs> <laughs> All three of you are involved in this outdoor pace. I'm going to be there. In, oh my God. I can't. It's an epic piece. I, I, I'm going to be dead after this. But, but the whole idea was from behind that. Because after my husband died, was being in shutdown and really trying to figure out, like, where is theater going? Because after a major death, you say, God, like, am I even going to do this anymore? 
And so it was trying to figure out like what was the last piece we talked about. And the last piece we talked about as a couple was this thing called Feast of Ghosts because I just wanted to do a sitcom comedy. And he was like, Muriel, no one's going to get it. You've got to like do something because we were somewhere. He was like, them hippies ain't going to get that. He was like, you've got to do something like you have to explain why do we feed the dead? Why do who these whose land are we on with the stories? And I see, and I real and that creation was really from also theaters ch shifted, right? Are the seasons going to change, right? And literally, if you th you know, I go back to my native teachings. Seasons are going to change. The the literal seasons we see that we see we we see their ecosystem around us is changing a great deal. Right, and we've been warning about there about it. But the reality is, the world is changing. The world that we're looking at dramatic change in weather, dramatic change in food sovereignty, dramatic change in health. We're looking at that now, and a lot. And I believe that it should be told in theater. And if us as theater makers, that's what I'm so excited. We go with that shift, right? There will be outdoor theater, right? if people cannot come together inside, right, because of disease, because whatever is the next thing that's going to hit us, right, next wave or whatever that's going to be, and will the seasons change? And I, that was a big, big, big thought. And so that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about looking, because I see a lot of young people saying, I want to change how this looks instead of this Western framework. Right, and I always say, okay, show me something. You know, let's do something different and exciting. So that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about working with the three of you women. You know, um, and I've already worked. You know, uh, and 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 what I find exciting too is that us understanding each other, at not only as women but women of color too, to understand that there is a commonality between all four of us. Right. You know, all four of us, we all come from distinct different backgrounds, but we all come from indigenous backgrounds and we have teachings. So that's how I'm excited to bring those teachings into into even marketing. Right. I mean, we, you know, New York Times, am I allowed to say this? Well, I'll say it. New York, <laughs> New, York, New York Times is always saying something bad about people of color's work. How do we change that? How do we call out that without someone saying, well, you're never going to work again if you say anything? You know what I mean? How do we change that shift that isn't hurt? When we put our life, we feel as, uh, as artist makers, we're putting our life on the line. We, we, we die a little bit when we're on stage, right? I, I believe this is how I speak for me. You know, and then when someone talks, it's like calling your child ugly. You know what I mean? And, and you're supposed to take that, but... There needs to be pushback if you're not understanding, if you're not taking a history lesson, you know, and the cultural exhaustion that, that goes with that. And I think we're changing the way of thinking. And yes, it's overwhelming. Same thing the last, this has been the best conversation I've had in two weeks. And three weeks ago, I told her I was quitting theater. <laughs> she doesn't listen to me. <laughs> I said... I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. This is nuts. And she was like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> she didn't even react. I thought she would say, oh, Muriel, da, da, da. She was like, yeah, okay, maybe, okay. And I changed my mind the following week. It's like one time I had a job, and I said, I really got to quit this job. And she says, well, just quit the job. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell her. I said, I'm going to tell them I had a nervous breakdown. She goes, you can't say that. And I said, and I went crazy. And she was like, these are straights. These ain't theater people. You can't tell the normal people you're having a nervous breakdown. So anyway, that's a little bit of that. And like, what are you excited about for this coming, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is. You know, let's end it on a high note. Oh. <laughs> I mean, for me, um, uh, I'm excited by the connection that we 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 have here. You know, I'm excited about Feast of Ghosts and that all of us are involved. Um, and the, uh, beyond that, this grassroots global arts movement, which I feel is this idea of Feast of Ghosts, having all of these different people and partners involved, 
Um, and how do we start creating more impact around the work of the artists? Because I, d I don't know how you guys feel, but sometimes I'm, you know, as I probably mentioned earlier, I'm just running all the time and not being able to really make the connections to have more impact around one artist's work. I mean, it's not just one artist, but one company's work, right? Yeah. And, um, and I think by creating this um, network, the, this networking system or, or, or broader sort of mesh that um, I believe we can make together, that excites me in terms of how arts can play a bigger role or a vital role in the way that we're gonna move forward. Um, I'll say ditto to just the excitement of this, more of this, more of this. And out of the more of this, um, I think often about the role of art in in culture, right? And one of the things that was exciting from this last year that I'm really excited about infusing in this next season even more at the workshop is when Hansel Jung did Marry Me, um, which we chose because I think Hansel's a brilliant writer, and I also really loved the opportunity to do wraparound engagement with a lot of community partners in what I call like the, the campus, the 10 blocks around us, where when we've done a lot of statistical research, we actually have a lot more people that come from 40, 50 blocks than the 10 blocks around us. How do we engage in a hyper-local way? These, these I used to bartend up and down Avenue A, so these are like the streets of my youth. <laughs> Very different time in my life. How do we engage more in the right where we are? That makes me really excited. So with Marry Me, we had not a lot of non-transactional opportunities to come together for community. So we had, um, you know, drag brunch or karaoke at Henrietta Hudson or all of these opportunities to, to build and gather community. And some of those people never saw the show. And some of the people came to see the show and never knew about Henrietta Hudson and went to Henrietta Hudson because of that. And so the idea that this, this process of making theater, which I do find to be sacred and illuminating, but it also is a beacon that can bring people together. We have so much social isolation that we can have a place of belonging. And sometimes that belonging is about reviving the spirit. Sometimes that belonging is having some very difficult conversations that we are not able to have in a lot of spaces and that often are, are um, that, that being in person together can hold conversations and hold the ability, especially in response to a piece of art that can actually be transformative and actually kind of hold opposition in a certain kind of way. So I'm just, I'm excited for the art itself, but I'm excited that the art is the beacon and a tool for a larger sense of belonging, convening, conversations, and, and collective progress. I love that. Um, well, ditto, ditto. What's, uh, what's, what's a triple, triple ditto? Ditto, ditto, ditto. Um, lots of ditto. Uh, no, I appreciate that so much. I, I think for me, I'm really excited also literally about the work ahead. Um, but I am excited about finding some stability in the new model. <laughs> like this, um, I can't wait for this stability. I'm really excited about that. And I think it goes back to a lot of things that we've shared already. It's about not being transactional, kind of what you're saying. Um, what does it look like to create an ecosystem that is not based on transactions? Um, and I think that's hard. I think that's actually a really difficult challenge. But I think it brings, you know, as you've said to me so many times, um, bringing the indigenous knowledge around collective thinking, collective decision making, honoring of people's ideas and creativity um, and, and creating a circle, right? Like, a, you know, creating a circle. I feel like we often are at these rectangular tables, right? And <laughs> I'm sure you probably were. <laughs> we we kind of made a circle. We have a, a semicircle going here. We have a horseshoe. We have a horseshoe. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, there's something about the the circle, and to create art in a circle instead of like you are paying the like you were saying earlier, right? Like, I gave you my money. Now what are you giving me? Like, trying to upend that, which will take a long time, I'm sure. But yes. That is the key. Yes. How do we sustain yes. sort of the work too? Yeah. 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 
sustainability. No. Go. Yeah, no, no, I mean, yeah. yes. Um, because we need that support because we're not relying on the ticket sales or we're not, you know, how do we change the model of theater and art consumption, but also the sharing of art? It's gonna take some brave folks who will step up and say, I wanna support that so that you can go forth and really put artists at the center, put audiences at the center, put makers at the center, humanity at the center, right? Um, so I'm excited about that. I think it's possible. I think it's going to be hard, but I think it's possible. Um, and I think for me, in the in the on a on a campus, that's uh, students are the main you know the main audience. What does it mean to entice them you know into a theater, into a gallery, into a creative space um, to learn to learn? Um, and Muriel's done this so beautifully at Brown, like. Students are learning from Muriel directly while she's at work making work and imparting that knowledge. Um, and so what are the structures that we need that are not transactional, that, that um, uh, sort of shepherd the next generation of art lovers and art makers and art participants so that when they all come to New York, because that's where they all want to come, when they come <laughs> to New York, they're experiencing your, it with a different, um, with a different energy and a different purpose, yes, and, and acceptance and excitement about the work that's happening here, which is so beautiful and, and gorgeous. Um, so yeah, I'm excited. Maybe maybe this new model could really make a difference in how, how, we, um, how we get there. It ain't easy. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't easy. <laughs> quadruple ditto. <laughs> quadruple ditto. It ain't easy, let me tell you. But if it was easy, everyone would do it. I mean, that's the truth. I mean, you know, we are out there, you know, in the front lines, and people don't think of us as front line people. And a lot of times we are. We are, because we're in the meetings, we're in the rooms, we're making work, we're encouraging artists, and we're understanding. You know, I mean, the three of you are even doing it more because we're, 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 we're a theater company trying to survive in this economic, you know, this economic times, right? But when you have to, and you're not relying on the monies, you can have, you know what I mean, to really say something. And I'm a true believer of that theater is a sacred place, and that's how I was brought up. And I was really brought up that, you know, whatever that is, theater is a sacred place. It's a church to me. It's where I meditate. It's where I think about where I create. And I really, and I was taught that very young, that this is a sacred place. And this is almost, a, it, to me, it's a religious experience. You know, oh, people keep on calling me. I don't know who's calling me. But anyway, <laughs> and it's a religious experience. I don't know. I, I, got, I got thrown off. Okay, I, we all have to go, right? Because you have to be at 6.30. You have to get a train. You have to do what you do. And I need to go home and go sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and it, this was wonderful. I really, you're my one of the three, the, you know, this was powerful. And I really want to do this for almost two years. And now we did it. And let's all do a high note. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. <laughs> Bye.